afternoon. Thanks everyone for for being with us on the the uh, <laughs> on the 2013 Back to Basics webinar series, the first first in this series. Um, we have uh, Greg Cava, Tammy Noodle, Good. John Flanagan as our experts are John and Greg. We have Jim Welsh as our backup for anything that comes up operationally. And we have our newest CAD member, um, Katie Gerke here. So everyone say hi to Katie when you get a minute. Katie, say hi. Hello. <laughs> All right. We have a serious uh, topic to, to get to today, so we're going to get right to it. Electronic onboard recording devices and you. Okay, Greg, I'm going to turn this over to you and, and to Mr. Flanagan here. Wow. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, first off, why are we here? Uh, I'm certain that all of you have heard about the EOBR, Electronic Onboard Recording Device. Uh, we're here for two reasons. Number one, in 2012, Congress approved and the President signed into law uh, a bill called uh, Moving Ahead with Progress in the 21st Century, MAP 21. In this law, it mandates that all commercial vehicles use an EOBR, electronic onboard recording device. The only thing that has not been firmed up yet and which will be announced in March is the drop dead date to which all vehicles have to uh, have an EOBR installed. The second reason we're here is we, and I mean Stevens Van Lines, the entire Van Lines, we have issues with our CSA scores and our rating uh, that need to be corrected. The major problem, or one of the major problems, all stem from log violations. Uh, we are on the FMCSA's radar and we need to improve our scores and to improve our rating, overall rating. John could speak more to the situation in which we're currently in with the CSA. Uh, thank you, Greg. Hello, everyone. Uh, our CSA scores uh, consist of seven basics or scoring categories, and we're currently passing four of the seven. Uh, the two of the three that we are not currently passing on are tied directly to EOBR, the first being logs and hours of service, and the second being the DVIR, Driver Vehicle Inspection Report, which is, uh, in our case, part of the paper log. And those are the two uh, deficiencies that the Federal Motor Carrier Administration assessed against us when they were here most recently, and it has affected our overall safety rating. And by the way, folks, this is not a secret. You, anyone with internet access can go out go out on the internet and view our safety rating and our CSA scores. Uh, for the EOBR, it does address both the logs and DVIR problem. Immediately upon use of an electronic log book, our most common log book violations, by definition, go away. Our number one violation is log book not current. You can't have a log book that's not current if you're using an electronic black box. The other one is uh, log falsification or, or, or inaccurate logs. Well, you can't have an inaccurate log. By having a black box, it always knows where you are at what time. And also, uh, you can't have log form and manner violations or no log book in the truck because you always have your EOBR. Additionally, this particular model of the EOBR, the Zeta device, which Greg's going to get into shortly, uh, has a built-in driver vehicle inspection report uh, on, in the program, and you can't log in or out of the program without completing your pre- and post-trip inspections and having a record of those, uh, having those completed. And it's all very uh, straightforward and actually pretty driver-friendly. So I'm going to turn this back to Greg. Okay, number one question is who's going to be affected by this law? This law is going to affect, and it is going to affect anyone who is currently required to file a paper log. Uh, that means 
every intra interstate driver, intrastate driver, and under some instances even local drivers. Uh, question has come up on local trucks. If you have local trucks that you're currently running that are running with inside the 100 mile air air mile radius of your terminal, and if the people are reporting their times of employment, uh, whether it be punching a time card or filling out a time sheet, and and uh, what's the last one? They work, they work less than 12 hours a day. Yeah, they have to work less than 12 hours a day. You might not need to install an EOBR on that unit, but if that unit goes beyond 100 miles, or you know, if they work more than 12 hours, you're going to need an EOBR in that unit. I want to explain one thing about this EOBR that we've selected. If you've got 10 local trucks that are normally functioning locally, you don't need to buy 10 units. If you you know, if you've only got one truck that might go outside that radius on any given day, you can swap that transponder from one unit to another. It does require you to go into the computer and basically tell the computer which truck that unit, that transponder is located in. But it doesn't, you know, this doesn't mean that you have to have a, a physical unit for every physical truck you have. It depends on your circumstances. Okay, what is an EOBR? In this program, uh, the little box you see on your screen is the transponder unit. That is what gets installed in the power unit of the truck. Um, it's very simple to install. It's simply that box there is approximately the size of a 3x3 three three posty note and a little thicker. Uh, it sits on the dash. There's a cable that plugs into that. And from there, it's run to the truck and plugged into the truck's computer system. It takes probably less than 15 minutes to, to install in, in any one case. It's a pretty simple uh, procedure. What else is required? Well, we need the box in the truck, and the driver needs to have either a smartphone a BlackBerry, or a tablet. Uh, how you manage that is, is truly up to you. Uh, if you have nothing but employee drivers, uh, you might want to opt to get tablets, uh, as many tablets as you have units, and every morning the driver is issued that tablet and he goes out and logs in and Away he goes. Um, this program is simple from the fact that if a driver does have a cell phone, a smartphone that's compatible, he can use that um, instead of a tablet. It uh, uses extremely little data, uh, so the cost is insignificant, truly. And it can be used. The, this program is set up so that you might have three different drivers using the same truck on the same day and there's there's nothing to change except the driver needs to log in showing that he's now the driver of that unit. So it's very flexible. Um, and he logs in right from his cell phone. Right, either from the cell phone or from a tablet. And as I said, it doesn't really matter as long as the phone has been registered or the tablet has been registered with in the computer. You know, you he can he can drive four different trucks in one day, and all he needs to do is switch truck numbers. So it, so it's flexible in that respect. I do want to point out that if you need a smartphone, there is a a website that shows the eligibility of the phones that are eligible to be used. Uh, typically, so far I've found that practically any Android made by Motorola works. The Samsung Galaxies work. Uh, the LG Intuition works. 
Uh, so it's it's you know pretty widespread. If it, if you kind of stick with those brand names, it's probably going to be on the list and it'll probably work. Uh, tablets, same thing. The Samsung Galaxy tablet, uh, although it doesn't, you know, of course, your driver can't make a phone call with it, but he can keep his logs. Um, we also require that it be serviced by Sprint, Verizon, or AT&T. At this point, those are the three service providers that we know work. Uh, even in some cases where um, AT&T might actually own another brand name, uh, and I can't think of what they are right now, but they do own other companies. If you have service through that other company, we found thus far that it doesn't work. So right now we're saying the service has to be through, I call it the big three. Okay, from the van, app, van operator's perspective, what's different? Truly, nothing as long as they historically operate legally. Um, the only difference to them is is they can throw away the, the paper log books and the pencils and the pens and the little rulers so you draw straight lines and they're not going to be required to carry uh, to do a trip sheet anymore. The uh, Log program keeps all the fuel mileage information. The only thing that they still will need to submit are fuel receipts. So what's different to the driver as well is that they will have to learn this process. Right. They, they, to actually use the device is extremely simple. I mean, in the very basic form, the only thing the driver needs to know how to do and remember to do First thing in the morning, he logs in with his driver ID number. Um, he puts in, if he's using a different truck and trailer, it'll ask him, you know, to switch the numbers to whatever he's driving. And uh, then they have to do a pre-trip on both the tractor and the trailer. Once they've done that, they really don't have to do anything else because this device will automatically put them on duty once they've completed their inspection. And once the vehicle starts moving, it automatically changes them to a drive to, to show that they're driving. Um, like I said, it keeps track of how long it displays to them, how many hours remaining they have before they hit the, the uh, 10, 14, and 70 hour rules. Uh, once they start getting close to running out of drive time, for instance, it, it turns yellow, I think, at a half hour. And with only 15 minutes remaining, it turns red so that they have a visual display that shows them, you know, i got to find some place to park for the night or, or whatever. Uh, but one thing that this device does do, <coughs> it causes drivers to have to think their actions out prior. Uh, for instance, the very first time we put the device in a, in a driver's truck here, um, he had 12,000 to load the next day, and he did what a lot of drivers do. They wait until the very last minute to leave from their residence and uh, drove to origin and proceeded to load his Twelve or fourteen thousand, whatever it was, and managed to go over the fourteen-hour rule sitting in front of the customer's residence. Now, I'm not saying this happens, but with paper logs, the driver might drive that extra five minutes to the truck stop after he's done loading, and uh, maybe forget about logging that. Uh, in this case. He can still do that. He can still drive to the truck stop, but it shows as a violation on his logs, and there's no way around that. Um, so you got to plan ahead a little bit. This driver now is headed in for about six, seven months, and he's had no problem since then. He just says that got to think ahead a little better and plan his work day. Um, there's what, what could he have done differently? What, well, what he should have done was 
left the night before, got down there, went off duty for his 10 hours, and you know, then, then went out early in the morning and started loading, and he would have been fine. But because he wanted to spend an extra few hours at home, it, it ran, you know, he ran into problems because of it. Uh, Greg, uh, that, it's good that you're talking about the time management, and um, a, a few drivers have, have asked, uh, well, I could just keep doing paper logs and, you know, just uh, uh, make adjustments as I need to that would uh, take care of situations such as Greg just uh, described. Well, we find more and more that, and this was discovered during our FMCSA visit, is that Every driver leaves a digital footprint as they travel around the country. Every time you cross a port of entry now, your vehicle data is captured. Every time you buy fuel or get an advance, that data is captured for the location, time, and date of the transaction. In the event that you are stopped and you have paper logs and they are inaccurate, it is extremely easy to, uh, to uh, determine that you are, not, you are falsifying or not accurate, accurately entering the log data. And why should that matter? Well, that was the core of the Federal Motor Carrier's uh, uh, violation that, they, that, we, uh, that we accrued under uh, uh, our audit in the spring of last year. So uh, it's, it's not something that we have the option of not doing. We are uh, we are told that it is necessary for Stevens as a group, as a carrier, to take remedial action to correct those deficiencies that they have noted. And frankly, uh, since we have instituted uh, log auditing since last uh, July on the paper logs that have been coming in, it has been, been, de been determined that we are incapable of doing this without the use of an electronic onboard recording device, be it drivers waiting to do their logs to la uh, a few days after the event or whatever, the accuracy is simply not there and simply not sufficient to pass the next CSA audit, which is what we're going to need to do to improve our safety rating. Hey, Greg. Yeah, just a, a technical question here. Driver has the uh, DLBR in his tractor. He has a smartphone, okay? Does, uh, checks in, does his pre-trip, both the track and trailer drives to the resident. He now has his cell phone, which is not, which is on his person and not in the cab of the truck. How does the cell phone uh, continue to record from a distance on its work time? Because that's the driver's log time. It, well, working within the residence. Okay. Well, the the system set up the the actual cell phone or tablet. Driver needs to be within 30 feet of the vehicle to log in and activate the program. The you know once he's logged in, he doesn't have to stay within 30 feet of the vehicle. I mean, he he can be in the residence or whatever, working, packing, whatever. The actual transponder unit in the truck keeps data for up to 30 days so that every time the driver goes back within 30 feet of the truck, it actually sends an update. So then, because we run into this obviously every day in operation, driver's cell phone goes dead, okay? Where's his battery now? It all, because he's in the house, he's using it to make calls and, and, and what have you. And, uh, so the, the, the battery goes dead in the phone. He puts it in the truck. He's charging it. Uh, now, most cell phones you can have on while you're charging. Is that when the cell phone and the, and the recorder is catching up on data? Yep. As long, long as the phone is has power and is within 30 feet of the truck. So, so as it's catching up on the data, the only thing that literally turns that uh, transponder off, he turns his cell phone off because he's done for the day. Okay. But the transponder, if I understand correctly, is still recording? It, it defaults to, when you log in, yes. you activate the transponder. It defaults to on duty, not driving, 
once you have done your pre-trip inspection and stays on duty not driving until you tell it something otherwise by either driving the truck okay. or punching off duty or sleeper. Okay. When you log out at the eve at the end of the evening, the it goes to off duty. Uh, when you're away from the truck, uh, it's going to default to whatever your last status change was. If you had it, if you didn't make any change, it'll put you on duty not driving. If you put it off duty or sleeper, it'll put you on that status until it's changed. Once you get back to the truck and start either moving the truck or put it back on duty, it will stay in the uh, last uh, duty status that you put it in. Okay. So, so you don't have to touch it other than to put yourself off duty or sleeper. Basically, once you've logged in for the day, you don't have to touch the touch the unit or be in the truck. Okay. So the driver now is off duty for the day. Uh, the transponder is in the truck. The engine is not running. So I'm, I imagine the transponder is still working off a trickle charge from the battery? Correct. Okay, so we and there should be no concerns about that transponder no. wearing any battery down in no. the winter? It uses minimal, minimal electricity. Great job in explaining that, thank you. Okay, so from the driver point of view, you're going to have some resistance to this. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the guys, you know, think that it's going to cost them money, uh, time, and they're just not, you know, they might not be technologically advanced. Uh, they might be just afraid of the phone. Uh, there's all kinds of things that come up. I can tell you, I've got approximately 30 headquarter units hooked up, and after I'm going to say two days of using it, I never hear from these guys again. And if I do, I don't hear anything truly derogatory about it. Um, most of them, a couple of them said, man, I'd, I'd never go back to paper logs because this is just so easy to use and they find out it's actually beneficial. There's some trickle-down benefits on this too that we're finding, Greg, in the headquarters. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're going there. Yeah, we're going, we're going there. There you go. For your, the, you know, what's different for you, the agent? Uh, number one, you know exactly where your unit is at. Uh, this updates every two minutes on, on your computer, telling you exactly where that van is located or that tractor. Uh, it gives you a lot of additional information that you can obtain from it because it records how fast the drivers drive. Uh, you know, the driver is driving. You'll be able to know right every two minutes if you like whether the guy's exceeding the speed limit or, you know, driving in a way that you feel abuses your truck because it also records hard braking, which means that he was probably tailgating or, you know, he wasn't paying attention. Uh, and it, it records all your mileages on the vehicle, too. Um, you no longer have to worry about submitting, submitting logs and trip sheets to headquarters here if you're running on our authority. Uh, you will still need to collect all the fuel receipts, though. And as John indicated, there's so much data out there now that they can use to verify logs, all of it date and time stamped, that we have problems with because sometimes drivers, they'll fuel, but they won't really write anything down on their log that they fueled until a week later when they go back before they submit them and they try to log all these fuel stops. And because of the different time zones and things like that, they, they forget that they were in California. And although the stub says 2 o'clock, if they're driving out of Saginaw, Michigan, that means it was really, you know, uh, 11 o'clock, I guess. Yeah. And if they don't remember to fix, you know, adjust for the time differences and stuff, that comes out as a, as a falsified log because they report that they stopped at a different time. <laughs> You'll receive automatic updates on any violations. If a driver exceeds the, you know, 14-hour rule or or the 70-hour rule, you get you get a notification through email that tells you on the same same day that this infraction has occurred, so that you can address it promptly with your driver instead of. You know, you might not get logs for 12, 13 days, and then you go back to them and say, hey, 
you know, why, why were you over 14 hours here? And it, by that time, it's, you know, it's ancient history, and everybody's kind of just let it slide, you know. Uh, this way, you can address the situation when it happens, essentially. Uh, another great benefit of this is, is any vehicle that you register and put a transponder in that's using Stevens Van Lines Authority, it appears on our computer here at headquarters. Now, what this does is, I know in the past we've had issues about agents upgrade, updating van locations. This tells us exactly where your truck's at, and I think it's going to open up a big opportunity for you to generate more revenue because our planners and dispatchers can see where your trucks are at, and if we've got orders there, we can offer them to you. So it's, I think it's a real win-win situation for headquarters and for the agents. Of course, the big thing is always cost. Uh, there's a cost for everything. Uh, we researched a number of different companies to do business with, and we found that uh, Zeta, which by the way, it, they were called Zeta, X-A-T-A, -A, and uh, since we started publishing all this stuff, they've uh, changed their name to XRS. So if you hear us say Zeta, we really mean XRS or vice versa. <laughs> They're kind of interchangeable at this point. Uh, there is a one-time charge for each transponder. It's $50 uh, that covers that covers the cost of the transponder and, and to set you up. Uh, essentially, you know, if you lose it or whatever, I mean, it's paid for. Of course, you'll have to buy a replacement, uh, and there'll be another $50 charge, but that's all there is there. And it's a $35 a month charge per transponder. So that's the expense you're looking at. <coughs> now with uh, you know, how much does this really cost you in the end? Well, let's think about it. How much time do you spend going over logs, making sure they get mailed in to you, and then you turn around and probably look them over, and then you bundle them up and you send them to headquarters? A lot of expense there and a lot of time involved. All that goes away. So if, if you've got, well, let's say you got 10 units, it's going to be $350 a month. You know, do you actually have 350 invested in doing the paper logs? I don't know, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's a reasonable price difference for the efficiency and the information you're going to gain from it. By the way, I just happen to remember, I, I did have somebody ask a question on here uh, about the Apple iPhones. Very popular phone, very nice phones. Unfortunately, Apple iPhones do not work with this program, and the reason being is Apple uses a proprietary software on their devices that uh, this, this program just doesn't work with at this time. Now, down the road, maybe, but at this time, uh, Apple iPhones and Apple products, actually, any Apple product is out of, out of uh, the question. <coughs> Judy. Okay, you may qualify for financial assistance with this program. If you have co-op funds available, Tammy uh, Stead will be able to tell you that. You may use these funds for the purchase of the transponder, installation, or purchase of smartphone, tablet, or Blackberry. And unlike co-op funds, you don't have to spend a certain amount to get that matched. It will be one for one. So if you spend $200, we will reimburse you for that 200 What a deal. Yeah, if you got co-op funds, you're golden. <laughs> OK, I just uh, ran some screenshots here to show you what your screens, a few of your screens will look like. Number one, we have a map view. Um, all of your trucks will appear on the map just like uh, they are on the screen currently. Uh, green truck means the trucks that 
logged on and in motion. Red truck means there's someone logged on and the truck's not moving, so they're either on duty or, or in the sleeper berth or whatever. And a gray truck means that the truck is parked and the driver is logged off. So there's no, no uh, you know, nothing going on with that truck, I guess, uh, is what you could say. Greg, is that a real, how far, how close to a real time? Two minutes. That shows you where that truck was at within the last two minutes. Really? Yeah. Wow, I, I envision these things moving like little Pac-Men. No, they don't do that. They can jump. <laughs> just a little bit, they might jump. Just a little bit. Okay. So it's about every two minutes. I mean, that's that's uh, that's pretty good. Now, for another thing for the agents, you will only see your trucks on your screen. Um, so nobody else knows where your trucks are, except for central operations. Jim Welsh knows. Jim Welsh will know exactly where all the trucks are at. And we're going to load them. <laughs> that's great. Good. That's good. Now, a little closer shot. Uh, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but you can place a tag on each of the vehicles, which will show you the truck number and the driver. <clears throat> and then if you want to get more information, you can click down Click on the actual truck, it'll bring up a block which tells you the time that the location was reported. Uh, it'll give you its latitude and longitude, that's in case you want to, you know, I don't know, sail, sail them across the ocean, I guess. Uh, it'll give you uh, an address. If he's parked in front of a residence or, or someplace, it'll, it'll actually give you the physical street address. And it will give you his speed and his direction if he's traveling down the road. Oh, Greg, a little Star Wars here. <clears throat> it is. We, we, you know how we Google Earth and look at addresses? and I'm going to show you that. Yeah, wait till you see Woo! it. Let's move. Ah, yeah. uh, another thing you can do is if you click on this view here, you can actually see the history of that truck for the last, whatever, six hours, 12 hours. I forget how it's broke down. So it'll show you where he's been and how he, how he got to where he's at. Let's take it a little closer, folks. <coughs> this is what Jim was starting to talk about, Google Earth. Um, if you notice, right here at the parking lot, there's a little green truck. That's where that truck is currently being reported at. Now, this is, a, this is a hotel just down the road from us where a lot of the drivers stay. So it just so happens, you'll notice that the grass is green. And, you know, people are out there sun tanning and stuff. Well, it's actually snowing here right now, but uh, it just so happens that one of our trucks was in the parking lot the day the picture, the satellite photo was taken. But this is how close down you can zoom uh, onto a truck's location. And this is two minute intervals again? Every two minutes it'll update. So what's nice about this is that uh, operationally, either central ops as well as your own dispatcher can literally see what service providers are working with or dealing, dealing with. So when that driver's on the phone and says, hey, take a look at this, this is not a safe situation. Absolutely. I need help with here or that. I mean, there's no, this takes the guesswork out of long carries, the guesswork out of uh, shuttles. shuttles. Uh, it helps uh, operations. It uh, uh, gives us more information to be able to help the service providers to, to really get the job done in, in, in the best possible manner. So this is this is beautiful stuff. Absolutely. You, you know, the one place that I know I feel it would be really helpful is your driver calls and says, hey, I can't get to the residence from here. Well, you can zoom in and you can look at the map and see if maybe there's a way in there that he doesn't know about. Right. Um, and it, it helps in that manner, in that respect. And, from, uh, from talking to the drivers, <coughs> uh, that that green that little green truck in that parking lot is pretty darn close, probably within 50 feet of where that truck is actually located. So it, it does give you a very accurate view of where he's at, and it gives you a good overall view of what his situation might be. And it also does away with all the... Uh, yeah, I'm at residence, and uh, <laughs> he's still a half mile away. Uh, 
And the funny thing is, is you know, that's one of the first things out of some driver's mouth is, oh, Big Brother's going to be watching every move. No, not really, but it uh, it does come in helpful. And as I said, so far, no real issues with it once they get get to use it. You know, Greg, the the, the, the whole essence of this, when you you can sum it up by saying time management. You know, we know that that the uh, PBO's uh, inability to really function with good time management skills has a negative impact on their driving record and customer satisfaction. And their ability to make money. And their ability to make money. Great point, Judy. So, so this is about time management. This is not Big Brother watching. This is about time management. It's about everyone's time management. Operational folks, customer service folks, the customer themselves, the service providers. So, I mean, this is this is outstanding, outstanding technology that we're that we're implementing. And you know, when you talk with the, the driver, and I obviously I get in a lot of conversation with them, that's really how I come across with it. It's from a time management tool aspect, both from not having to worry about the paperwork and their log or their log stuff anymore. Uh, it, it really has all the devices that they can use, uh, you know, uh, to even help them run their operation. Keep in mind, too, we are going through a transition with many of our drivers that are just learning how to use email. Okay? Now, if, a, if an individual that's learning how to learn uh, how to use email in two weeks could be up and running on this, think about it. Okay? Uh, a lot of our guys are having their kids <laughs> even working with them exactly. on this, you know? They say, well, get me home. So we get them home, you know, within a couple of days. And we get that transponder to the house, and the kids take them down to the store and say, "Dad, you get this phone here." Boom! They get, and then literally, it's a family event. Look at hooking the father up uh, with his uh, EOBR. So I just wanted to pass along. That's, stuff that's what I tell a lot of the guys. I say, "Hey, go find a ten-year-old. They can show you how to do it. You know, if you can't figure it out." We do have a lot of questions, and we will get to those questions. So let's move on through the. Yeah. Bottom line of the whole thing is, this is not something that we just invented in our mind and, and decided that it was best for everybody to do. This is something that government is going to mandate. We don't know yet, you know, when that drop dead date is. We, because of our safety issues and for other reasons, have decided to step it up. Greg, I want to speak to that just real quickly here. I know the government mandate, nobody knows when the drop dead date will be, but it will be in the next few years. But uh, under our uh, safety plan with the government, you do not have the option of not addressing it. Now, they didn't say we had to use EOBRs, but they said that EOBRs would be looked upon very favorably in order to restore uh, our safety rating and address the safety deficiencies. They didn't say, you need to do address these deficiencies if you feel like it. We are required to. We are. We have to take what they call take abatement to, in other words, correct those deficiencies that have been found. To try to do it with using paper logs is simply not going to work. We've tried every way. Every way. Uh, uh, we've tried doing paper log audits. We've tried driver instructions and training on the paper logs. And simply, we have not been able to achieve the level of compliance that's needed. Additionally, back to what Judy was just saying, and, and uh, Greg also, uh, there is a business case for using this. You'll save time. You'll save, uh, you'll save money. You'll improve productivity. So there is a business case for doing this. So I'll climb down off of my soapbox here, but uh, uh, it, it isn't like uh, we have a choice. Okay. Yeah, that's one other point. If if you haven't watched the video out on um, the website, it was listed on your invite to this. Please go out there and watch that because it explains. Number one, your driver can actually gain hours of driving time because this records down to the minute instead of into fifteen minute increments. So, you know, if he stops and starts. Or it goes from driving to on duty to driving to on duty a few times a day, he could gain a half hour of actual driving time. 
out of this. So it, it there's other other things listed out there too that are actually a cost savings and a benefit. So I thought the private headquarters the other day where I showed them how this is going to help them with this fuel consumption. We actually did the math on it, and it's about a forty in this particular case is about forty eight hundred dollars savings in fuel. In so, years span? Yeah, uh, in, in a 12-month period of time. So, I mean, if anyone wants to call me and talk to me about that, I'm more than, you know, please give me a call because the big savings is going to be in fuel and time, and time is money. And time is the only thing that we're affecting on this. We're, we're stepping up the pace, and essentially any truck under Central Operations Dispatch we're going to need it in by by the busy season. We want everybody to run through this busy season using it. The um, rest of the vehicles, we we can hold off until the end of the year. But by the end of the year, we'd like to see everybody up and on it if you're running on Stevens Van Line's story. I can't see a lot of questions from this distance here, so I don't I'm know not. if we're answering some of those as yeah, we're talking. Right. Okay, we're going to. There are a lot of them. Yeah, there are. Well, hey, there. See, where are the questions? Uh, can this work with a prepaid account? Yes. As long as you go to Verizon, Sprint, or AT&T and set up a prepaid own account, uh, and you use a, you know a, an authorized smartphone, uh, no problem. You can you can do that. I'm sure that question is asked in case the driver does not have a credit card or can't afford it. Absolutely. We had a driver uh, the other day that had that issue. He went and he actually got a debit card with uh, with a master charge logo on it, and he direct deposits on that, and Verizon took it as just like a credit card, so you don't have to prepay. Yeah. The uh, I can only speak for Verizon because I've actually talked to them. Uh, you know, if, let's say a driver does have bad credit, um, he goes in, and if it's bad, what they might, what they said they would do, is they might require a, a I don't know, 120. I think you said 125 dollar cash deposit that's held in lieu of the next month's payment. Um, he's got absolutely terrible credit. Then the the way around it is the prepaid account for which uh, you know. They're, he's actually paying in advance, so it's uh, they don't have to worry about losing money on the deal. Uh, but it can be done; shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Uh, during the driver boot camp, uh, we'll be going over this uh, actually with the device, so that people can see how it works. Um, and we'll have some drivers there who have actually been using it for a few months. If you know, if people if people don't believe me and say that there's really no issues once they start using it, they'll be happy to uh, answer your questions. We actually, Greg, will be uh, at the University of TCS. We will actually be bringing drivers in that have uh, CSA violations that just can't seem to get off the snide, they will be brought in specifically to have their trucks installed with them and trained up on them. So what's nice about this, and that's why I'll throw a shameless plug in on here, that at the University of TCS, if you send your lead op operations persons there, they will learn anything and everything about the EOBR. In fact, we'll have a truck there with it installed and a walk around so that uh, and we'll even have the devices that you can take them back with you. So that's a great opportunity, you know, for uh, your organization uh, to to be involved in that. And that will be uh, April uh, 11, 12, and 13th, right in uh, Midland, Michigan. Next question. Okay. Uh, what about part-time drivers? Uh, can they still do paper loss? Uh, the short answer. Once the mandate comes through, is no. Uh, every driver operating a commercial motor vehicle is going to have to have an EOBR in the truck. Uh, currently, 
uh, I I would say currently yes. If it's a part time driver, you know, drive one day a week, you can still use paper log, but really there's no advantage to it because the transponder is already in the truck. It's already hooked up. Uh, you know. You know, Greg, I see this where uh, a, a regional uh, agent, okay, someone that's out in the Levin Western, right. and one of the, you know, they have three or four guys qualified with us, and they, uh, they're they running a unit, and but they don't like to stay out for two weeks. So because the unit is easy just to, for the next driver to sign up, don't, why give yourself the headache? You know, put it in the, uh, put the unit in the truck, you can even switch off on the phone. You only need one phone because that, you know. So you don't have to buy four cell phones and four transponders. Right. So those of you who are sending your local guy out for four days, bringing him back, sending another one out for four days, uh, I see no reason why you would not why you'd want to be even dealing with paper logs with four guys. You don't have to. And as a matter of fact, if, if when you think about it, it actually becomes a bigger headache for you right. using two separate systems, one of paper locks, one of the EOBRs. Right. Uh, you know, it's just harder to keep track of and uh, harder to make your reports on. Yeah, uh, Brennan says there that Zeta informed him that iPhones will be working soon. Fantastic. I, you know, I, I knew that eventually they'd get around to it, but it wasn't, wasn't their priority, I don't believe. Uh, Does the driver need to be within 30 feet of the truck to change his duty status? Actually, no. He can change his duty status as often as he wants. It's just that it won't report that until he does get back within 30 feet of the truck. Uh, and it does. It, it, a little bit of yeah, Well, whatever. You know, uh, It'll, it'll report it and it'll report it historically so that, yeah. you know, if you did it an hour ago, that's what's going to show once it does update. Uh, Bluetooth, yes, it is done via Bluetooth. Uh, the connection between the phone or the tablet and the transponder. So uh, whatever device you get does have to have Bluetooth capability. Uh, and to be honest with you, I don't know that you can even buy one of the newer models that doesn't have it. Um, uh, Steve, uh, Redden, just uh, reiterating how much that's going to cost a year, uh, and he's come up with the number of trucks he has saying it's going to be about $3,500 a year, and I can't argue that. That math works out, but uh, how much are you spending now taking care of buying log books and gathering the information and mail and overnights and all the all the things that are involved in keeping track of it. Well if you just operate in ten trucks and from a fuel consumption, if he's able to save two percent on what he spends in fuel a year, I'm sure that equals thirty five hundred dollars. I I would think so. Okay, who gets the information? Uh, okay, let me explain the way this is set up. If you have your own authority and run under both your authority and at times our authority, uh, you will have access to all that information. Uh, but it will, will be reported to you separately so that you can file the reports that are required from your authority and we glean the information that we need for our authority. Uh, so basically, basically every mile your truck drives is reported to you in one way or another, either, either under your authority or our authority or, uh, you know, your local authority, whichever's, whichever you're running under. Okay, does, uh, does Stevens pay Zeta and deduct from the agents, or do the agents pay directly? Yes, you pay directly. Uh, 
the bulletins that have went out and everything indicate who you need to contact uh, to set up the service. They'll train you and your people on how to use it. And, um, you know, it's, it's your bill. <laughs> but you do need to set up a separate account uh, for yourself. With Zeta and your phone company. Right. And then again, you know, as far as the phone service goes, I mean, I don't know too many people now that don't have a phone, uh, a cell phone. If they've got a BlackBerry or a smartphone, the, the cost in data that it uses is so minimal that they wouldn't even notice. And I can't see an employee driver who's got a smartphone objecting to loading the app on his phone and using his phone as his as his logbook, but that's something that you and your employees and you know need to hash out, I guess. <coughs> Smartphone, in essence, is the carpenter's hammer and saw, the bricklayer's trowel and level, the mover's dolly is key tool for the job today is his smartphone. It's all about communication. All about communication between operations, between the service provider and our customers. Number one complaint from our customers today is that you mean to tell me you cannot immediately contact your driver? They don't understand it. They refuse to grasp uh, uh, grasp that concept. So, you know, it's the communication that's the key to total customer satisfaction. Okay, uh, from uh, Peter, uh, can this unit replace our present GPS system? I don't see why not unless you have GPSs on trailers. Uh, this, this unit, of course, is hooked directly to the power unit. Um, so that would be the only limiting factor, I guess. Do you anticipate how this will affect time performance and delivery speeds, especially during the peak season? I'll talk to that. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, we've already started making adjustments uh, for this, in, uh, for, for this uh, change in terms of how we're now managing uh, log hours and, and, and making sure that we're, we're well within uh, all regulations. And we're watching the dispatch on how we're, pl on how we're planning the drivers. Uh, even to the point where we are talking with uh, our move coordinators in terms of how they're uh, setting up uh, load and delivery dates on larger shipments. So uh, I, won't, I don't want to get into that third, you know, for an hour here. But uh, if you have any other questions about that, feel free to give me a call. But no, we are definitely uh, utilizing this tool, even from a dispatch standpoint and a planning standpoint, so that we can make sure that we're not uh, planning incorrectly that we'd be taking that unit and putting it in our droid. Okay, I'm seeing several questions up here about the co-op dollars. You need to contact Tammy Stead, it's a commercial agency. What's her extension? Her extension is 403. I got to write that down. Okay. A um, couple other questions. Uh, is there a learning period granted to new users, and is it monitored by anybody besides agents and Stevens? Okay. First off, uh, what I tell my drivers when they first get it installed and start using it, I tell them to continue to run trip sheets and paper logs in conjunction with the logging program for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, until they totally feel comfortable with it and we're able to see that everything's being done properly. Um, anything, how do I want to say this? <laughs> okay, anything that comes through that electronic data system, uh, you have control over correcting. Uh, if a guy forgets to log off duty, 
you can go in and change him from off duty to off duty or from sleeper to on duty. The only thing you cannot change is the drive time. If that vehicle is moving, it's showing that you know he was driving the vehicle. Uh, other than that, it, it really you know there's a little learning curve to the computer and how to go in and change that stuff, but it's all all valid. Uh, one and <clears throat> one thing about the learning curve is Zeta has excellent online videos which are free. The driver videos has a series of five. Uh, they run about four minutes each, and they take you through a day in the life of a driver, how to, how to log on, how to use it during the day, how to do pre- and post-trip ins inspections, how to log off, and how to manage uh, uh, incidents and exceptions that are always going to come up. That is online, it's free, and the total run time of the, of the four videos combined is right around 20 minutes. There's also a five-minute video on how to install the... Uh, the, the transponder in your power unit. Uh, as indicated earlier, it sits on the dashboard with an adhesive, double-sided adhesive. There's a single wire connection to the J bus on your on the truck. Uh, I estimate I've done about 15 of these installations myself, and it takes about 10 minutes. You don't need any fancy tools or anything. It's quite easy and straightforward to do. And again. How to do it is also online, and it's about a five-minute video. Yeah. All of this is available to any Zeta user, and for your drivers, I would just sit them down and run them through that 20-minute video, maybe even more than once, to give them a, and it's a very well done, uh, very professionally produced video, uh, training video for drivers as to make them comfortable with this new device. Yeah, I want to make a big commitment here to our agent family about training. We are training our own people up internally in operations on the EOBRs. You install an EOBR in the truck, we'll train your, your, your driver up on it. Bottom line. Thank you, Jim. So do not be afraid about who's going to train what or what have you. We are, we are strongly committed to have uh, as many units as we can up and running by May 1st. So from a training standpoint, do not let, uh, hesitate going forward because of that. Okay, um, and the second part of that question is anybody besides the agent and Stephen seen the, the information on the transponders? Uh, no, uh, it's strictly viewable by us. Uh, well, XRX can look at it, I guess. Uh, you know, if you call for help, uh, they can go in and look at the same thing you're looking at so that uh, they can help fix it. Yeah, I'm not quite sure that there should be concern on that because even today on how they're collecting data of all of our units that are going across borders and taking videos and timestamp, looking to comp data, looking at your fuel seats, uh, receipts, they, 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 an auditor can piece together down to the hour where, where you, you were and where you should have been. So that really the information that we're collecting here, or that that, that, that transponder collects, is what you're putting down in the logs, and 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 they're already, piece you know, being able to piece your day together. So we're not talking about people's checking accounts. Uh, uh, now, I guess the only piece of information you would be maybe question about. Well, what about the phone number? Uh, I don't even believe the phone number is in, uh, included on that. It's just no, it's it nice. just happens to be a data line that's tra that's transporting information. So. Uh, from a security standpoint, there's no reason to be concerned about that. Okay, uh, satellite images, uh, the picture I showed of where our truck was in the parking lot. Uh, maybe maybe people misunderstood. Those are not real-time photos. That's why I said it. The grass was green. Well, let me tell you, the grass isn't green here right now. Uh, it's snowy white. But it does, uh, you know, normally those photos, they, the, the actual photo you're looking at might be five years old, uh, but it does, you know, it sh gives you a general look at the, 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 the area. But you did mention it's probably about a two to three minute uh, delay. Of the location. Of the location. Of the location. Okay. Right. So the photo is two to three minutes old. No. no the photo is maybe five years old. So the, the photo. Oh, okay, I got you. But the yeah, location the photo is old, but the spot. Yeah. The monopoly. The monopoly uh, player is. That's it. Right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, come on! I'll learn this. Yeah. Uh, 
Um, no, grass, no green grass here. If the cell phone is off, will the GPS still work? No, I don't think that it. The GPS will show where that truck is at when the phone was shut off. I do not believe the transponder actually transmits. I believe it needs the phone to actually transmit the data. Um, and I know probably what you're asking, why you're asking. Uh, you know, as a driver takes off with my truck, how do I, how do I, you know, find it? Uh, the only thing I could say is, you know, if a driver really wants to take off with a vehicle, even if it has GPS in it right now, the report's 24-7. First thing I'm going to do if I'm that driver is yank that GPS out. <laughs> so throw the phone on the seat and take off. That's it. So uh, that's an interesting question, though. Really. Yeah, I know. I'm going to have to look into it. Uh, again, most smartphones you can be charging them and still have them on. Okay. I mean, I do mine every day. So when he's charging the phone in the truck, it's on. The GPS will be working as he's driving. Does the GPS talk to him? No. They don't, uh, if, you, if you're asking if the driver has the capability of looking like at that map. Because the GPS, when, he, when the GPS is, he, he, I, I envision that he could type into his cell phone the address where he's going. Yeah, he can. Okay, so. But no, it won't. No, I know what you're going to ask. Does it give him directions? No. Verbally? No. But it will feed back. How, how does, no, it does. There are there are no direction capabilities on this program. I mean, there's other programs out there that are free that he could use, but programs uh, that he would download on his smartphone. Right. Yeah. We need to gather that information together and get that to them because that's very important. GPS today. But yeah, I like telling drivers where to go when they call me. Well, we like. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we need to collect this uh, that information because that, that's very important. GPS in the driver's truck is directly related to fuel consumption, time management, and TCS. So, uh, I, you know, if I told you at least two or three times a week, I thought that customer would say, "You mean the driver doesn't have GPS? You can't find, you know, he's five whatever." Well, we can do. But it doesn't give you Yes, but what I'm saying to you is that we need to figure out, just like we have the cam scan that we download on a smartphone so the driver can take uh, uh, pictures of his paperwork and send his attachment in here, which saves him a lot of money. We need to investigate a GPS that goes on the smartphone that kicks back uh, information. Um, uh, let's see here. Can the agent buy phones or tablets for the drivers to use just for the purpose? Absolutely. Just, you know, whatever you feel is easiest to manage and to uh, to do. I mean, if, if you've got only two trucks and those are the only two trucks you're going to put it in, I don't know, you might want to super glue a tablet to the dashboard. Uh, that way, whatever driver jumps in the truck, you can just log in and, and away he goes. But like I said, you know, everybody's got smartphones nowadays. I wouldn't be surprised most of your drivers already have it. Uh, and because it doesn't really cost them anything, I can't see them objecting to using their own phones. Okay. Uh, I'm, trying, I'm trying to read while I'm uh, sitting here. Uh, this person has a driver that has a Verizon Android phone and was able to download the app, but can't log into the site. His phone doesn't have the market basket. That is oh, oh. okay. Um, I find that hard to believe. Uh, I'm not going to say your name, but uh, every every smartphone I found has some type of app store. Um, and what you need to do when you get the phone is, is basically you have to go to this app store to find the app to load down to the phone. Uh, there's, it's free. There's no cost to it. It's actually called, uh, I always type in X-A-T-A, Zeta, and it brings up the app, which is actually called 
T is in Tom, P is in Paul, mobile. And that, that is what the driver needs to load onto his phone. Um, I will give you a call this afternoon and we'll search this out because you know each, each phone carrier might use a different different service. Uh, Verizon normally it'll show uh, Google Play is, is the app that opens up their app store. So we'll see what we can do. Great. Since you're the Mr. App Guy, yeah, I'm sure you could find an app out there, a GPS app out there, that even if it's like five dollars a month, that uh, that someone could download um, their smartphone. Most your smartphones come with it. Yeah, and most of them have it, and there are some free downloads. Uh, yeah, but I mean, where it talks to you. Yep. Yeah, I know. Really? There's, there's one on. You know what? I'm sorry. You know what? But you know what, Jim? I got your phone for you. Yeah. And I know there's a free one on your phone. Oh, what are you holding out for then, darn it? Well, well I'm waiting for you to and, search and, around. And find anyone, one. Uh, but then, there, there's people like me out there that might be technology challenged, okay, that need a little help and support with it. So. Um. Ten comments flying there. That one. Up. Let's see. Okay. Uh, one person mentioned that people have you know, one of their drivers currently has service with T-Mobile. Just spent five hundred dollars on a phone. You know, what do you do? Well. Right, you can just drop back and punt. Uh, <laughs> yeah, are we talking about a local driver? You know, I don't know if we're no, talking, we're talking about a road driver here. Well, I know who you know, bottom line is, I you know, I go back to this thing about this is going to be mandated down, uh, by, by the federal government in, in a very short time, and uh, you, you know, I mean, you have to make an investment in your business, in your livelihood. And it's really no different than if I was required a calculator that in my line of work and I needed to have a better calculator in order to keep up with my industry, I'd have to go do that. It's kind of simplistic there, but you know, I mean there there's got to have to be a commitment associated with this. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Um, someone missed the part about how this saves fuel. Well, call me. I'll call you because it is, it's not a two-minute discussion. Okay. And and then uh, I'd be more than happy to to, uh, to to sit and discuss that with you. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Let me take a look at what we've done in the future. Well. Uh, uh, the question is, drivers currently go over their hours in order to uh, pick up and deliver on time. What will be done in the future to get these shipments picked up or dropped off on time if the drivers are shut down? Well, we already last summer uh, really had a, a program in place on resetting the drivers' hours. <clears throat> I could see not just Stevens, but I can see our industry taking a serious look at their load and pick and delivery spreads to uh, to make the adjustments and 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 I've talked to some of my uh, colleagues and, and and other and other carriers and and that, that that's the route that they're really looking at so uh, you know there are adjustments as you get into your uh, electronic time management uh, tools that you will be changing the way you do business. Okay. Uh, by the way, Steve, Steve Brennan says that uh, you look, download a Google Maps app, it'll give you directions. So not truck routes, but it'll give you directions. Yeah. Send me that talking dog, Steve, and let me see that, that, that you, you send me all the time. Uh, and remember, guys, Jim said, if you have these units, 
and are having trouble using them, or uh, if you're just getting them and you want help, operations will guide you through um, utilization training. once they're installed in training. Uh, one other good question. Actually, I wish I made a slide of it, but uh, does the computer show the route the driver takes so that we can replay that at the office? In other words, when you bring them in, you can sit down and have it up on the screen and show them? Uh, absolutely. It, it does. It uh, shows where you stopped. Shows how long you stopped. Uh, so if you know you got a crew going out and they didn't get to residence for an hour more than you or you know later than you expected, and they say it's traffic, uh, you can go back and show them how long they stopped in front of the donut shop. Uh, it uh, it's very nice that way. And uh, you know one of the things that we see this uh, helping with is uh, we let's lay it out there. We have too many drivers that think because they're delivering 3,000 pounds, it's okay to show up at 11 o'clock in the morning. Well, it's not okay. The customer's work day doesn't start at 11. They're standing there looking out the window, looking for you, and you call them night before and say you're going to be there between 8 and 10, and you, for whatever reason, decide to show up at 11.30. The phone calls that that creates throughout the organization are painful. We totally, all the thousands of dollars we spent to get that shipment on the truck, and we decide to show up at 11 o'clock and deliver a 3,000 pound shipment because the driver thinks it's okay. Well, again, it's not okay. And, uh, you know, so if I answered your question on that, I mean, Okay, okay, we're right. going to try to wrap this up. Yeah, I think we've got through most of those questions. Um, we do have a question on sales reps. Will they be educated too? I'm not sure where that question is going, but if you would call me um, at extension 310, we can talk about that. Well, one thing, the education is going to have to happen throughout the system because, you know, just like you know, we're, we're making sure that planners and dispatchers now look at things time-wise to make sure that all this can be done legally without any issues. Uh, drivers now needing to, you know, think a day in advance of how they're going to, how they're going to service the job or how long they're going to drive or where they're going to park. Uh, salesmen need to be re-educated to the fact that they might have to explain to people you know, we operate under a set of laws. We use electronic onboard recording devices, which accurately record our times. Maybe we won't be able to make, you know, the, the promised date if, if certain things happen. But well, yeah. all that marketing, yeah. sit with us, and we will put together a point of sale presentation <laughs> associated with the the benefits to the customer on the onboard uh, electronic onboard recorders, from a safety perspective as well as uh, knowing 100% where their goods are at any given point in time, uh, and then to, to the point where uh, if some if your competitor walked in the door and said, nah, "Don't worry about that stuff; it's not required." Uh, you know, I mean, we could even encourage the customer to go to, we could have a special page put on our company website, Judy, that talks about this type of stuff. And but, it, you know, it, it will be addressed. Okay. All right. Uh, look at that participation. This is a breathtaking discussion. We have uh, almost 100% of the people that signed up, 100% still here. And they're still taking this out. <laughs> Okay, for our pink minute, we are going to try to pink. This is um, um, can, can they hear me? Barb, can you hear me? No, Judy, it's Stacy. Yeah? There is a really good question up there. How does it work if the driver is in an area that doesn't have good cell service or no service at all? Uh, and like I said, the, the, the little transponder that sits on the dashboard keeps track of up to 30 days' worth of information. 
So the next time he hits an area where he has cell phone service, catch on an update every day. Catches up. Okay. All right. We just wanted to share a little bit with you on the, the pink initiative for this month. Um, and throw something out there, and I know it's quick this month, but uh, show your support for the campaign with a photo of members of your team supporting Pink in some way before Friday, January 18th, to be put in a drawing for 50 bucks for a Hungry Howie's, Howie's Pizza. Um, so we need your help on this. We need your participation with the Pink Initiative. And we thank all those that have jumped on board and are doing so well for us and for themselves. Okay, February 20th is our next webinar for Back to the Basics. And we had a topic, but uh, marketing kind of backed out on us. They, they want to have a more complete idea of initiatives, 2013 initiatives going forward. So your topic will be announced. Thank you very much for your attendance. Remember, any questions, um, please give one of us a call. We're always available. And if you, you have a unit uh, transponder and you're having difficulty with it or getting your drivers up and running with it, please call. Thank you very much. Good.